Welcome and thanks for being with us this day. May God bless you as you uh, observe this worship and join in with our worship service this morning. Uh, I just wanted to start by uh, thanking all those people that were involved in our drive through communion last Sunday. And I had just a brief video to share with you about what that was like. So uh, I invite you to, to watch this uh, video about that event. As we continue, our relaunch team is going to be and has been meeting uh, as we've been thinking, considering how we're going to be doing in-person worship starting in the next few weeks. Uh, and this week, what we've been doing is we've been sending out a relaunch survey to uh, let you all give us feedback on what you would be comfortable with and things that might happen at worship services as we begin those. Uh, so uh, I want to invite you, you're going to be receiving, if, if we have an email that uh, we know of for you, you're going to be receiving a survey by email. And if you would, please fill that out and complete it and send it back to us uh, so that we can kind of figure out exactly where the congregation is and where the, uh, the extended family of the church is so that uh, we can kind of sculpt the worship services for the future as we begin that in just a short period of time, really. Also, I want to thank those people who contributed last week to the Red Shield Diner Dinner as we fed 150 people down at the Salvation Army, uh, and the Salvation Army expressed how uh, blessed they were to have Church of the Good Shepherd support them and to help the poor and help those who are homeless down in the downtown area. Uh, and so, a thank you to everyone who contributed in any way that you did, whether that was in the delivery or in the making it up, uh, making up desserts, uh, offerings, things like that that you gave. I also wanted to uh, just say that, uh, of course, part of our worship is offerings that we give to the Lord, and you can do that in a couple of ways. You could uh, send uh, a check, if you would like, uh, by mail into Church of the Good Shepherd, and our address, 10928 Southwest 15th here in Yukon, or you can go online to, uh, to our website, umcgs.org, and go scroll down the page, and you'll get to the Give button. Click the Give button, and it will send you to our giving portal through Shelby Next, where you can contribute to the general church fund, either by pledged or unpledged giving. With that, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. As we begin worship this day, I want to invite you to enter into a call to worship with me. And what I'll do is I'll point to you and let you do the response. And we'll see that on your screen this morning. Wisdom gives a person patience to let anger cool. And then I'll read a section out of, Psalm, excuse me, out of Proverbs 14. Uh, and then I'll point back to you for the response. So let's begin. Wisdom gives a person patience to let anger cool. And then hear these words from Proverbs 14. The wise are cautious and turn away from evil, but the fool throws off restraint and is careless. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but one who has a hasty temper exalts folly. And then the response, wisdom gives a person patience to let anger cool. Amen. shepherd you make me lie in fields of green lead me by the still waters restore righteousness to me though i walk through the valley i will fear no evil thing 
for you are with me you comfort me surely goodness love and mercy will follow wherever I go surely goodness love and mercy will follow wherever I go surely go to God in prayer. Almighty God, Lord of life itself, we each stand under, under the umbrella of your abundant mercy, and without you we're desperately lost, alone, and afraid, but we have been freed and called. Thank you for calling us to be your people, a people who are becoming renewed, learning to love more completely learning to look past and beyond skin color, to see into the eyes of our neighbors. We thank you for planting us in a nation of freedom, but all is not well. We humbly lift up our nation into your hands. We need your deep wisdom. We need solutions that only come from the heavenly realms. We need leaders that are led by you. Show us your wise ways forward. Give us creative and novel answers to this painful and disturbing time we live in. And we count it pure joy to call you friend and to pray the prayer Christ taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. of the rain. 
Hear these words from James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. And from Ephesians chapter 4, For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him, as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness in God, in true righteousness and holiness. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being in worship with us today as we continue on in our sermon series on the book of James. And today, looking at how faith helps us to stay calm, stay calm in times of crisis and stress and difficulty, uh, as we've all gone through over the last few months, that's for sure. But before we continue on in that, I want to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray together. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks that you are present with us here and wherever we're at this day in your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks that you're guiding us and directing us into your way of truth and life in your son, Jesus. Help us this day to open our hearts and minds, to hear you speak to our hearts and minds, and to be changed, to be transformed, to be lifted up so that we could become more like Jesus. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Have you seen any evidence lately of anger in, your, in society or maybe in community or in your home? You know, I, I was... Uh, 
reading uh, on Friday, uh, and I came across a little story that something had happened in Denver. It's just almost unbelievable how anger can sometimes get out of control. Uh, and there was this couple, they were walk, walking their dog, uh, and it was near the place where, the field where the Colorado Rockies plays baseball, and they're walking down this street. Now, I've been in that street and in that area for many times before as I've gone to Colorado Rockies games, uh, and uh, they were at one point or other, and they were trying to get their dog to go to the bathroom, and, and there the guy was encouraging the dog to go to the bathroom. And there was somebody in an in a apartment in the second story, because there were, there's a kind of storefront things, and the second story is where they have apartments in that area. Uh, and there was somebody in the apartment, and he heard this guy out on the street trying to get his dog to go to the bathroom, and he, he opens up his door, and he comes out onto his balcony and yells at him, what are you trying to do? Yell at that dog, or are you going to train it? And these two guys, they get into an argument with one another out there between the guy on the balcony and the guy on the street, and they start yelling and screaming at each other. And the guy on the balcony goes back into his apartment, gets a gun, and comes back out and shoots both of them down there on the street. And a 21-year-old woman was killed there on the streets of Denver on Friday morning. Why? Over dog poop. Dog poop. Unbelievable. Have you seen any evidence recently of people acting out in anger. You know, uh, not only on a national level like an incident like that, but maybe here locally you've seen that happen, or, or maybe in your homes as well, or in your lives as well. Uh, and of course, the truth is, what the Scripture says over and over again, is there's some pretty negative consequences can happen when we let our anger get out of control in our lives. And, and, you know, that especially is the case when we get into situations where we're, well, we're stressed out or we're in a crisis thing or, or we're anxious up about something in our lives. And, and not, a, not un, unusually, we get kind of in a situation where we sometimes get angry at somebody else because of something. Uh, and sometimes things happen that we wish wouldn't have happened. And the reality is that, that we need to, well, we need to resist that. Now, James understood that, and so when he was writing to these Christians and he was writing to them about problems that were taking place and struggles and stresses as they were going through as they were being persecuted for their faith, he realized that one of the things that would happen is that they would get all stressed out, and, and sometimes they might tend to get angry at one another, or, uh, angry at the situation, maybe even angry at God, and, and so he wanted to encourage them to get control of their anger, to calm down, to settle down. And so he explains to them the importance of that. And he actually does that in two or three different places in the book of James. And he says, you know, you, you need to get control of your anger. Now, I understand a lot of times uh, what we think is, well, I, you know, we can't control our anger, that it's out of our control. It's an emotion, and there's nothing that I can do about it, and what have you. And, and sometimes we make excuses about it, you know, like, okay, my, my dad was really, uh, he was given to anger and out of control, angry bursts, and, and so was my granddad, and I'm just like my, ga- my dad and my granddad, and so there's nothing that I can do about it. And, or maybe mom was like that, and maybe she had a lot of angry outbursts, and, and you know, I'm just like, like my mom or something, uh, and, you know, there's just nothing I can do about it. No, that's not true. That's not true. We do have control over our anger. We just have to choose to have it. Let me give you an example. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been in a loud argument with somebody else? And maybe you've been yelling and screaming, you're going to get your point across and what have you. Uh, and the phone rings and you pick up your cell phone and you swipe it and you pick up the cell phone and put it, into your, put it next to your ear and you go, Hi, this is me. What happened? Just like that, you got control of your anger, didn't you? We do have control over anger if we choose to do that. And we've got to make a resolution, a declaration to ourselves that we're going to control our anger. Now, that's why James understood the importance of that. And he actually puts it, one of my favorite little passages in the Bible is what he says in these particular verses out of the first chapter of James, where he says this, he says that human anger does not produce God's righteous purpose, or what the old King James Version used to say, the wrath of God, the wrath of man does not work the will of God. He said, we get into a contrary direction with where God wants us to head in our lives when we let our anger go uncontrolled. And so he gives us some ideas and, and about how we can do that. And I want to talk about, well, I guess the steps, the steps to controlling our anger and to calming down in the midst of a crisis or a stressed out situation which this year we've all been in. So listen to this first step. Uh, The first step I think we have to do is we have to understand to count the cost, to count the cost of our uncontrolled anger. 
That's why if you look on your screen there, you'll see from Proverbs, a hot-tempered man gets into all kinds of trouble. Is that not true? Or people with hot tempers do foolish things. Is that not true? Have you ever been in a situation like that where you've done something because you were angry and you thought to yourself, oh, no, I wish I would have done that. I wish I wouldn't have said that. I understand what the consequences are going to be of that. Now, just to give you an example, I remember years ago when I was in seminary and I was in this theology class in seminary and there was this guy who was a world-known theologian that was teaching this theology class. And he was also known to have a quick temper and a kind of really explosive temper. And one day we were in this discussion section with this theologian and uh, we were talking about this section in this book, me and about 20 other seminary students and in kind of this round table and he was up there at the head and and we got into a section, and, and there was this one person in the room, and the other person in the room, they were kind of disagreeing with what he said. And at one point, he just kind of explodes in anger. He jumps out of his chair, and he says this, that's stupid what you're saying. That's just stupid. And everybody, whoa, what is that all about? And it wasn't too long until one of them was in tears. And the other one had backed his chair away from the table. And all of us were kind of leaning back. Now, I don't remember anything that guy said that day. But I do remember his anger and how he couldn't control it. And then I talked to some of the faculty members later on and I, about that. And they said, we understand. We've experienced that too. And he doesn't understand the cost in his relationship with other faculty members in the university. Because anger has a cost when you let it get out of control, doesn't it? So first of all, I count the cost. Second thing I do if I'm going to get control of my anger is I slow down. I slow down. Now, this is exactly what James is saying to us. Look at that passage from James 1. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And here's that, what I was talking about a minute ago. Human anger does not achieve God's righteous purpose. So what's he saying? First of all, I need to be quick to listen, quick to listen when I'm in a stressed out situation or a difficult situation. Because, because it tends to bring the, blank, the stress level and the anger level down in the situation. Let me give you an example. So uh, when I was uh, first years or so of my ministry uh, and uh, was in a church and we did this, uh, this uh, youth mission, I mean this youth trip, uh, which my where wife uh, affectionately refers to it as the youth trip from hell. Uh, and uh, maybe you've been on that trip before. Uh, and we were, got through this youth trip, and three days later or so, I got these phone calls that there were these angry parents that wanted to meet with me about what had happened on the youth trip. And, okay, sure, I'll, I'll do that. And so I call up this pastor who's been in the ministry for many years, and I asked him, I said, okay, so this is what's going on. What do you think I should do? And he says to me, well, first thing you should do is you should listen. Just listen to him. And the second thing, he says, now, do you, like, take notes when you're at a meeting? I said, yeah, I tend to do that. He says, okay, so just listen and take notes of what they say because you want to remember what they said and, and what have you. Uh, and so, you know, take notes. Uh, and then if they ask you a question, just answer directly as best as you can. Oh, okay. And so I get into this meeting, and the, the parents are kind of tensed up, and you can see it in their faces, and they start talking. And I, I said, okay, I'm just here. I'm here to listen. And hear what you have to say. And I listened and I wrote down what they had to say, yes, and, and kind of kept track and thought about it and would ask them a question or two. And as I was doing that, guess what? The anxiousness and the stress and the anger in the meeting kept going down. And James is just giving you wise advice. Be quick to listen. Second, be slow to speak. Slow to speak. You know, uh, you know what happens when you get angry. You want to you tell your story right now. You want to let it all out. You want to just tell them what it is. Uh, and James is saying, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Be slow to speak. Now, we had a president of the United States called Thomas Jefferson who had a saying about that. You may have heard this saying before. He says, when you get angry, count to 10 before you say anything. And if you're really angry, count to 100 before you say anything. And what was he suggesting? When you get angry, be slow to speak. Slow down. And finally, be slow to anger. Because the reality is when, 
when we get uh, hurt or when we feel frustrated or when we feel frightened, we're fearful about something, that it tends maybe sometimes to come out in some form of anger or some form of belligerence towards somebody or something. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's kind of like, for, it's kind of almost comical in the way it happens. For instance, take frustration. I remember years ago, I had a, we had a pastor in the little town where I grew up in, in the little Methodist church there, uh, Pastor Bill and Pastor Bill. And my dad, they got along real well, and, and every once in a while they'd go over to the golf course, the little country golf course over in Luther, Oklahoma. And it was one of those golf courses that had sand greens, and we'd get out there on the golf course. Now, Bill had a kind of a temper about him, uh, and what would happen is he would hit a, he would hit a shot, and it would slice off into the, into the trees, and he would throw down his golf course, and it'd bounce all in, he'd like this. And he'd say, oh, slow down, calm down, calm down. And then he'd get up to another shot, and he'd cook it into some place, and, and he'd throw his golf club up in the air, and he'd stomp around and stuff. I, I, didn't, I don't remember anything about what Bill said in his sermons. But I do remember his being quick to anger out on the golf course. Now, I'm sure there's maybe a golfer or two before that has experienced that as well. But being quick to anger is not helpful. And what James says is, slow down. Slow your speaking down. Slow your anger down because that's not going to work the will of God. If you just, all of a sudden, bam, you're right on it. So the first step, I count the cost. The second step, I, I listen. I slow, I'm slow to speak. I'm slow to anger. And then there's a third step. I release wisely. I release my anger wisely. You see there what it says from Ephesians 4. Paul says this, If you become angry, do not let your anger lead you into sin. And do not stay angry all day. Or as the actual translation goes, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Now, what is he saying there? He's saying, first of all, he's saying, you know, just because you're angry doesn't necessarily mean you're going to sin. You're going to do something wrong. But it is kind of, it, you're kind of at the edge of a trap. And you don't want to fall into the trap. And so he says, don't let your anger lead you into sin. And so you've got to learn, first of all, what are the wrong ways of releasing my anger? What am I doing that, that, is, that alienates other people? That What am I going to do that, that I might do that, that might hurt my family members or hurt my relationship with God? Am I releasing my anger in a way that's belligerent? Am I releasing it in a way that's accusing other people? When I'm angry, am I start, do I start saying, you, you know, you did this, you did that. You should have done this. You should have done that. You're always like that. You know, if I'm saying stuff like that, I might be in problem areas or... Um, sometimes people get angry and they get into violence. And sometimes that violence takes place in a home. And I just want to tell you guys, if, if you're violent in your home, you need to stop it. This is just a word straight from the Lord. You need to stop that. So he says, don't let it get control of you. There's a right way to release anger. Now, I'll give you an example of it. So I don't know, maybe about three or four years ago, uh, I was at a pastor's conference, and at one point in the pastor's conference, we were in this room, there was I had 20 pa pastors or something like that, and there was a person that was kind of facilitating that, and, and we were talking about uh, churches, there were guys that would go up and they would present about their churches, and this guy, he's a pastor out in western Pennsylvania, he gets up, and he says, okay, he says, uh, you know, he says, I, I just feel so angry at my work, and I, uh, anybody ever felt angry at your work? I feel so angry at my work. I feel angry at the people that are there and angry about what's being done. And I just this all the time, and I'm thinking about it all the time, and it just seems like there's nothing that I can do about it. And so this person who was facilitating said, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you, let's, let's see, let's check about your family here for just a minute. So draw, draw us a diagram of your family. And he draws a diagram of his uh, parents and his grandparents on both sides of the family and this. And so talk to us about your family. Well, you know, my dad, he had a hot temper and he did this. And, and my granddad over here on this side, uh, he would do this and he would act out and he would do all kinds of stuff. And, and my, my mom and my grandmother, they didn't have a very good relationship. They were constantly with each other. And, and, you know, there was somebody that did something to me and I've never talked to them in the last 30 years and stuff like that. And, and we asked him, well, just a second now, do you think that any of that has a bearing on the way that you're feeling anger at work? And he looked at us. He looked at the facilitator. And he looked at the board. And he said, yeah, it, yeah I guess it does. Well, yeah. 
And he was like, okay, he realized that what he was doing was he was confessing the roots of his anger. And he realized that the Holy Spirit was now speaking to him and says, you know, you got some problems going on in your family and you need to deal with that so you don't have to blow up all the time. And so we asked him, so tell me, what do you need to do? What one, what one thing might you do in the next month in order to help that out? And the guy says, well, I guess I probably ought to go talk to my dad about some of this. Sounds like a good idea. Are there relationships that have been wounded in your family that need to be healed? Are there places that you need to give forgiveness to other people that are in your family? Is, are things that happened in the past uh, that you need to confess in order to let them go so you don't have to be captured by anger all the time? Remember, you're at the edge of a trap. Don't fall into the trap, says Paul. Confess it led by the Holy Spirit in order to get to the roots of it. Now, there's a, a fourth thing that I would suggest, and this is throughout the, script, throughout the Bible, really. Guard my thoughts. I need to guard my thoughts when I'm, I'm in a crisis situation, a difficult situation, and I'm stressed out. Look at what Paul says in Romans 12. Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world. Now, isn't that true? Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by how? Changing the way you think. Changing the way you think. Listen, now uh, let me give you a story about how important it is, how, how, how we think, and how, how we think really uh, informs and, and is the foundation for our anger. I was listening to a guy speak a number of years ago, and he was talking about how he went up to New York, and he was uh, doing some public speaking there in New York, and at one point he was on the subway, in the subway system, riding the subway there in New York City, and, and he said, uh, I was riding along, and we got to a subway station, the doors opened up, and in through the doors comes these four wild acting kids, and they're crazy, and they're running around and stuff like that, and their dad follows behind him, and the kids come into the car right next to me here, and, and they're just right across the way there. Their dad's sitting there, and, and the door shuts, and we're off down the, the, down the subway tracks. And he says, these kids, they are just wild. They're yelling and screaming and running around and jumping and throwing things at each other and stuff like that. And, and dad is over there, and he's not doing anything. He's just sitting there. He's not even, he just kind of acts like he's oblivious of what his kids are doing. And he said, the more I watch this and the more I watch these kids, and they were disturbing me, and I got mad at him, and I thought, you know, he ought to do something about these kids, and these kids are out of control, and he was angry at these kids as well. And so he says, I'm going to tell him something. I'm going to get this guy straightened up. And so he says, he, he leans over to him and says, Mr., don't you think you need to get to control of these kids? And the guy kind of startled, looks up at him, looks at the kids. They're acting, they're acting all kind of crazy. And then looks back at him and says, yeah, yeah, I guess I should, but... My wife, their mother, just died. And I guess they don't know how to take it, and I don't know either. And he said, I felt so ashamed about how angry I was at those kids and at that guy. And all of a sudden, he said, my compassion turned, my anger turned to compassion because my thinking about the situation had changed. That's the power of our thinking as the foundation for our anger. You know, um, years ago, there was uh, bracelets that were coming out and stuff like that was coming out, and it had WWJD on it. You remember that? Some of you may still be wearing a WWJD uh, bracelet or something like that. WWJD meant, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And they, people wore those to remind themselves, okay, what would Jesus do? Uh, I think before that, we probably ought to have a, H-W-J-T, how would Jesus think? How would Jesus think? How would the eyes of Christ look on this situation? How would Christ think about these people? How would Christ think about the situation that I'm in? What would Jesus think in this situation? And if we switched over to that way of perceiving other people and perceiving our reality and our situation, you might find out that that our stress level and our anxiousness start going down, and we see the world in a very different way. I've got to guard my thoughts because my thoughts are the basis of my emotions. Finally, there's a, this is really an extremely important thing. I've got to connect with the power. I've got to connect with the power. Okay, it's great to say, 
you know, I, I need, I'm going to take a res, I'm going to resolve, I'm going to get control of my anger, and, and yeah, I'm going to s- be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger, and I'm going to do that, and, and I'm going to change my way of thinking. Okay, but how are you going to do that? Where's the power to do that? Well, Jesus gives us a key when he says there in Matthew 12, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Let me give you an example of what that looks like. So in October of 2006, there was this guy who had had his young daughter die, and uh, he was really angry about that loss, and he was angry about God letting that loss happen, and he was angry at the world being the way it was and how unfair things were that he lost his daughter. Uh, And so what he did was he got a gun, and he went into a little Amish schoolhouse in western Pennsylvania, and he shot several young girls in the schoolhouse and killed several of them. And after that, Charles Roberts shot himself and died. And now, if you had just had your young daughter or granddaughter be murdered, what would you feel? Anger? Rage? Hatred? Well, this is what happened in that situation. And that day, one of the Amish grandfathers of one of the girls that was murdered came out and said that he just wanted the world to understand that he forgave and his family forgave Charles Roberts. And the Amish community, they went to Charles Roberts' family in order to comfort and console them. And they invited the Roberts family to come to the funerals of the girls uh, if they would like and be there. And when the funeral for the murderer Charles Roberts happened, there were more Amish at the funeral than there were non-Amish. And why did they do that? Well, it was because it was a heart matter, wasn't it? Because their hearts were full of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And because they understood what Christ said, about you should love your enemies. You should love people that abuse you. And you should understand how enslaved they are. And you should care for other people and you should let God have revenge. It's not your fault. It's not, I mean, it's not your position, my position to do that. It's vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's our position to forgive and to love. They acted out of their heart And that's what controlled their anger, was the love of God in Jesus Christ that had been poured into their hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's where the power is to get control of your anger. That's where the power is to stay calm in a crisis. When it's a stressed out situation, don't look at other people with uh, worldly eyes and worldly traits, but look at him. Look at him with the eyes of Jesus Christ. And there, there you can find the freedom that you need to say no to the trap of anger that is trying to pull you into. So what do I need to do this week? In a world that's stressed out, in a world where, where anger and hatred and violence are evident everywhere, I need to decide, no, I'm not going to act like that. I'm going to go a different way. I understand that there is a cost for uncontrolled anger. And I'm going to listen, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. I'm going to confess my anger because I want to get to the roots of it. I'm going to let my mind be renewed in Jesus Christ so that I I look at the world and look at other people in a different way and I'm going to let, let my heart be open to him and to his love and let him change my life that way. And that's where I'll find power to do this. In a world that sometimes seems like it's gone mad, You and I can choose a different way. Let's pray together. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks for your love and grace towards us. And we praise you for who you are, a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And that you did love us so much that you gave us your only begotten Son. Help us. In a time when we've all been stressed, in a time when there's been so much turmoil, in a time when we've been threatened and frightened in so many different ways, help us to resist getting out of control. 
but to stay calm and to gain peace in you. Help us to follow you in the way that we look at other people and we look at circumstances, a way that's filled with grace from our hearts. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few announcements in closing. Be sure and complete your relaunch survey this week. And your offering can be sent online at the church website, umcgs.org. Just scroll down and click the Give button. Or you can put it in the mail to us. We want to thank our musicians, sound and video technicians, all who contributed to make this worship experience great. Thank you for being here today with us. Please share this worship service, a link with someone you know. Invite someone to worship with us next week. Receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.